Right, let's get going. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third of our series of Property Breakfast Briefings. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Julian Greenhill. I'm joined this morning by Ema Murphy and Harriet Holmes. We're all barristers at Wilberforce Chambers, specialising in property litigation. I'm also grateful to Hayley Eustace and Harry Nicholl of our marketing team who are assisting us this morning with some slides and polls. Uh, we're going to spend the next hour exploring with you the topic of leasehold guarantees. Now, as the company, as the country rather, emerges from the challenges of the COVID pandemic, it seems almost certain that landlords will be seeking more advice on how to enforce against guarantors, and equally guarantors will be looking for ways to avoid or limit their liability under guarantees. So it seemed to us that it's an opportune moment to revisit this area of the law. It's a technically quite complex area of the law. I think it's made trickier by the uh, quite difficult interplay between some common law principles and uh, uh, statutory law, principally the, uh, the 1995 Act. Uh, and we'll also look at some key issues and cases. Don't worry about jotting down the names of the cases that we discuss because we will be circulating a case list uh, after the briefing, so you don't need to spend time writing down case names. We welcome your contributions to the discussion. We'll be having some polls during the session in order to gather your views on one or two topics. We also welcome questions. So please, for that purpose, I would ask you to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens to ask your questions rather than the chat function. Uh, and feel free to raise your questions as we go along. Uh, we will aim to pick up questions at the end, but, but as you, if you raise your questions as you think of them, that, that, will, um, that will mean you don't lose sight of them before we get to the the Q&A session we'll, we'll hope to finish off with. Um, so in a nutshell, the situation that we are addressing today, um, you're acting for a landlord who's seeking to recover sums due under a lease, familiar situation, but the tenant is not able to pay the sums due. That may well be because it's insolvent or it's refusing to pay on some COVID related basis. But there is a guarantor who has agreed to guarantee the obligations of the tenant. In other words, there is a covenant of guarantee, whether that be a covenant in the lease or in some other document. Uh, and typically it would look something like the following. And if I could ask uh, slide two to come up, there we are. So we've, we've put out a, a typical guarantee provision there, which reads as follows. The lessee shall at all times pay the rent herein before reserved at and in the times and in the manner herein before contained and shall duly observe and perform all the covenants and conditions on the lessee's part herein before contained to be observed and performed. And, and that's an important linking word in this common type of covenant, and that if the tenant, that if the lessee rather, shall make default in the payment of the rent herein reserved or any part thereof, or in observing and performing the said covenants and conditions or any of them, the surety, that's the guarantor, will pay and make good to the lessor on demand all loss, damage, costs and expenses thereby arising or incurred by the lessor. Uh, and obviously the, the, the question your client is going to need to answer, uh, uh, your landlord client is, can the landlord recover sums due from the guarantor? And if so, how? Uh, now the observant among you will see that that typical covenant contains two distinct obligations separated by the word and, as it appears I think in the fourth line of the slide. Um, and Harriet, there's, there's a difference, isn't there, between those two obligations? Yeah, absolutely. So let's just spend a moment having a think about the difference between, because what Julian's talking about is there being a difference between a guarantee and an indemnity. Um, and it's worth just spending a moment reminding ourselves of the difference between um, those two things. Um, Harry, you can take down the slide that's on the screen at the moment now. Thank you. Um, so... Most of you will recall that an indemnity is a contractual promise to accept liability for another's loss. It's a primary obligation because it's independent of the obligation of a principal, a third party, to the, to the beneficiary of the indemnity under which the loss arose. So um, the, the idea, as I said, the key thing to remember there is that it's a primary obligation. Now, looking then at a guarantee, that's also a contractual promise but it's a contractual promise that's either to ensure that the third party fulfills its obligations, that's what you might call a pure guarantee, or to pay an amount owed if the third party fails to do that, that would be a conditional guarantee. 
but both of them are, are guarantees. And the key distinction between a, a pure guarantee or a conditional guarantee of the type I've described and an indemnity, as I just summarised a moment ago, is that in either of the cases of the pure or conditional guarantee, the guarantee is a secondary obligation because it is contingent on the obligation of the third party, the principal, to the beneficiary of the guarantee. Now, that's the kind of the, the default position. Um, and it's the default because what the, the guarantee would need to be expressed in different terms in order to impose additional obligations on, on the guarantor. So the example that Julian put up um, is one that is drawn in a way um, that seeks to impose both the obligations of a guarantee on the guarantor, um, but also includes a related indemnity. Now, why am I even trying to talk about this and spending a bit of time looking at the distinction? Well, the distinction matters because um, a pure or conditional guarantee without anything more tends to be quite advantageous to the guarantor because it, it confers, unless these particular rights are excluded by the guarantee, various rights that are available to the guarantor including the ability to get an indemnity from the principal or um, rights of set off or rights to subrogate um, to the beneficiary's right against the principal under the primary agreement. And those, the, the panoply of rights that you may be able to sub subrogate to include rights of set off and to any security that the beneficiary may have taken from the principal, the principal in our case being um, typically the tenant. Now, whether the document in question gives rise to a guarantee or an indemnity is, of course, a question of construction, um, which is why Julian was flagging um, the terms of the typical guarantee provision that we'd put up on the slide. And as was the case on that slide, um, quite often um, the, draw the guarantee as drawn includes both a guarantee and a supporting indemnity so that um, the beneficiary can have the benefit of both. Now, what's worth just sort of recalling when, when looking at your contracts is that if there's any uncertainty as to which terms of the guarantee create which obligation, i.e. which part is guarantee, which part is indemnity, the court tends to choose the interpretation that is less onerous for the guarantor, and so is more likely to char characterise the obligation as a guarantee not an indemnity in the event of uncertainty. Now, again, the reason we're spending a bit of time just reminding ourselves of this is because in many, if not most, modern commercial leases, the liability imposed on a guarantor is in, su is in substance coextensive with the tenant as principal debtor. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's, it is the liability of an indemnifier, not just a guarantor. So you've got essentially both. Um, the effect of that is that the liability of um, the guarantor is not dependent on the principal remaining liable. Um, now, we've, there'll be a, a list of cases that get circulated, but when that comes through, it's worth having a look again at the EMI, EMI case from 2016, because um, in that case, you get um, at paragraphs 30 and 31, the court sort of unpacks um, this distinction and quite neatly summarises um, the position by reference to the particular clause in that case. So it's worth having a look at it. Anyway, back to Julian, because he's going to now talk about whether there's a valid guarantee. Thank you, Harriet. Well, that's, that's an important distinction we, we need to bear in mind. Although uh, the covenant commonly contains both indemnity and guarantee, it is, it is still a distinction that is, is relevant at times in practice for reasons we'll, we'll come on and mention in a moment. So uh, thank yeah. you for that, Harriet. So the first question that you need to ask yourself if you are acting for a landlord uh, is whether the guarantee that you wish to sue upon is valid uh, and enforceable, because if it isn't, you, you don't have a claim against the guarantor. And to answer that, you need to identify whether the lease is a new tenancy or an old tenancy in the terms of the Landlord and Tenant Covenants Act 1995. 
we'll call it from now on the 1995 Act. It's, a, it's an act with which I'm sure we're all familiar, although it, it, it's, it's a, a complex and, and fiddly statute and not one that, that many of us would claim to have at our fingertips, I'm sure. Um, a new tenancy is a tenancy granted on or after the 1st of January 1996, uh, and an old tenancy is one granted at any time before that date. It's a little bit more complicated than that in practice because there are a few circumstances where a tenancy can still be granted after 1st of January 1996 and yet be an old tenancy. For example, if it was granted pursuant to an agreement for lease that was entered into before 1st of January 1996, but given that old tenancies are becoming uh, increasingly rare, we're not, we're not proposing to get into that uh, today. So if the lease you're dealing with is a new tenancy, the crucial point is that the operation of the 1995 Act has the potential to completely invalidate a leasehold guarantee entered into in certain circumstances. So even for that reason, it's important, isn't it, to be clear from the outset whether one is dealing with an old or a new tenancy. Yes, Julian, absolutely. It's absolutely crucial. Um, in practice, as Julian said, there are fewer and fewer old tenancy around, tenancies around, certainly in the context of commercial rack rented properties. It's now more than 25 years since the Act came into force. However, we thought we'd take a quick poll to see if we're, we're right in that assumption. So hopefully a poll will pop up in a commercial context. Have you encountered an old tenancy in the last 12 months? Let's see what we can say. No, yes, that's what we thought. Most people not, but actually well, more people than I thought there have seen one. It's quite high, 37. Right, we will yeah. be discussing old tenancies um, later in a bit more detail. So thank you for that. Um, but going back to this question of, well, how do you know if you've got a valid guarantee? Well, the starting point is in 1677. <laughs> As things are with guarantees, there are a class of contracts that have to meet formal requirements by being in writing as provided by the statute of frauds. Um, but given here that you'll be dealing with a written lease, that's really only of historical interest and not much of an issue, is it, Julian? No, and so for that reason, the focus in terms of validity is really going to be on the provisions of the 1995 Act. So, so let's just start at this point by reminding ourselves of the structure and purpose of that Act. The principal mischief at which the 1995 Act was aimed was the continuation of the liability of tenants after they had parted with leases. Now, you'll recall that under the pre-1995 common law principles, um, the original tenant and the guarantor under a lease remained liable for the obligations in the lease for the whole of the term, regardless of whether it was assigned onwards. Uh, and even successor tenants and guarantors were often required to sign up to contractual agreements to be liable for the duration of the whole term of the lease, even if the lease was assigned on to, to one or more successors in title to the tenant when the lease still had many years to run. So there was obviously uh, potential for unfairness arising from that, and it was that unfairness that the 1995 Act was enacted to put a stop to. Yeah, that's right, Julian. I mean, the principal mischief was addressed by Section 5 of the 1995 Act, by which a tenant is automatically released from the tenant covenants of the tenancy on assignment of the tenancy to an assignee. So automatic release on assignment. Um, the 95 Act provides two exceptions to that automatic release. First is under section 11, which deals with excluded assignments, that is assignments in breach of covenant. They do not secure a release. For our purposes, it is the second exception that is relevant. And Harry, if you could stick up slide three, please. This is section 16 of uh, the 95 Act. Section 16 provides that on an assignment, the tenant can enter into an authorised guarantee agreement or an AGA in relation to the performance of a tenant covenant by the assignee. So this provides an exception to the general requirement of, of section five that the tenant should be released on assignment of the term of the lease. The tenant, let's call them P1, is permitted to enter into a guarantee of the performance of their assignee, T2, of the very same covenants that T1 was required to perform immediately before the assignment. And, and that exception that Ema has just described is undoubtedly a significant exception to the new scheme. And one can see that it, in a sense, cuts directly across the whole intention, the mischief that we've identified the 1995 Act was aimed 
uh, to address. And for that reason, it is a, it is a very limited exception uh, because uh, an authorised guarantee agreement, an ARGA as it's called, is a very specific type of guarantee. And it can only be entered into by the tenant. Uh, that's the, the assignor of the term of the lease. And we can see that from the wording of subsection 2A, where we see uh, uh, the reference there to the tenant, uh, not to any other person. So it can't be entered into, uh, or a guarantee of this sort can't be given by anyone else, including uh, it can't be given by the assigning tenant's guarantor. A guarantor cannot give a valid arga. Uh, and if we then move on to the next slide, please, Harry, we will see from section 16, subsection three and four, that there are other criteria that have to be met in order for an ARGA to be valid. It has to be entered into in particular circumstances, those circumstances set out uh, in subsection three. So there has to be an absolute or qualified covenant against assignment. Well, that's fairly common in, uh, in, in commercial leases, of course. Consent has to be given by the landlord subject to a lawful requirement that the tenant guarantees the assignee. And thirdly, the ARGA has to have been entered into pursuant to that requirement. Uh, and then the agreement has to have the various attributes that are set out in subsections four and five of section 16, uh, including, for example, that the ARGA cannot impose liability to guarantee anyone other than the immediate assignee. So if there's any attempt to guarantee the obligations not just of the immediate assignee but of successors to that assignee uh, then you won't have a, a valid arga uh, and equally the flip side of that is that it's also clear from the subsection that the arga has to come to an end uh, when the assignee itself assigns the lease in other words when t2 assigns to t3 and that, that's all provided for by section uh, 16 subsection 4. so if it doesn't do all of these things if it doesn't meet all of these criteria it's not an ARGA, and it, it's therefore a very closely uh, uh, circumscribed, if you like, exception to the basic uh, structure and policy of the Act. So that's the exception, but uh, how does the Act go about creating invalidity, Ema? Yes, well, that's said I'd done a couple of other sections. Um, Harry, can you go on to the next slide, please? Um, <clears throat> section 24.2 provides that if any other person bound by a covenant of a tenancy shall, on assignment of the term, be released to the same extent as the tenant is released. So what that means is that the section has the effect of releasing a guarantor of T at the same time as T is released on assignment. And in doing so, that furthered this, this fundamental purpose of the 95 Act we referred to a moment ago, um, because the liability of guarantors for many years after their tenants had assigned the lease was part of the mischief at which the 95 Act was aimed. And to complete the picture, we then need to look at section 25, which is the anti-avoidance provision in the Act. And Harry, if you could flick on, that's great, thanks. Section 25 is quite lengthy, but we only need to focus on section 25.1a. Um, an agreement relating to a tenancy is void to the extent that it would, apart from this section, have effect to exclude, modify, or otherwise frustrate the operation of any provision of this Act. Now, in practice, it's these two sections, section 24 and 25, that have given rise to most of the case law, as the courts have gradually worked out their implications of them, in particular in relation to leasehold guarantees. And get rid of that slide now, Harry, thanks. And the leading case on that question is one with which I'm sure we're all familiar, and that's the case of KS Victoria and the House of Fraser, which was decided back in 2011, 10, 10 years ago now. Uh, and that was the case that decided that a guarantor of a tenant cannot, cannot give a guarantee of the obligations of that tenant's assignee. And the reason for that is because to do so would frustrate section 24, which is one of the sections Ema's just described to us, because the, the purpose of that section was to release the guarantor on any assignment by the tenant, and such a repeat guarantee, as it's called, uh, would be void under section 25 of the Act, because it involves the guarantor taking on a new guarantee liability at precisely the moment when section 24 tells us that they must be released. Yeah, that's right, Gillian. And, and that's so, even if the new guarantee is volunteered by the guarantor. So it doesn't apply just in cases where the landlord has insisted upon it from the guarantor or where there was a prior agreement to provide it from the guarantor. 
it applies, this voidness applies even where the guarantor offers a repeat guarantee, secure an assignment, for example, from T1 to T2. So one consequence of this is that um, it is not open to a parent company, which has given a guarantee of one of its subsidiaries as tenant, to offer a similar guarantee of a different subsidiary on assignment of the lease. And that is regardless of how commercially desirable or how beneficial it might be to the parent company for it to do so, for example, if it's restructuring its organisation. I mean, that point, Ema, that you just made was undoubtedly, as I'm sure many of the people attending today will recall, the point that most surprised the property industry at the time, the fact that it's not open to a parent company to even voluntarily offer such a repeat guarantee uh, on, a, on a, if you like, an intra-group restructuring process. And the point goes even further than that, because the Court of Appeal in KS Victoria held that Section 25 invalidated, uh, to quote their words, any agreement that involved the guarantor, the assignor, guaranteeing the assignor's assignee. So that applies whether the agreement was entered into prior to the tenancy, whether it was contained in the tenancy, or even if it was entered into post the tenancy. Any agreement that, that involves that concept at all, if you like, is invalidated. Uh, and it not only means that the guarantor cannot give a repeat guarantee, it also means a, a guarantor cannot validly agree to give such a guarantee in future, for example, uh, as a condition of consent to assign, and the, the case of Tyndall, Cobham and, and Ada Hotels, which was decided in 2014, uh, was on that very point. So it is a, a very sweeping uh, provision on the interpretation of the Court of Appeal in KS Victoria, uh, and there is considerable scope for invalidity, as the many cases um, since, since the Act have shown. Um, now, the Court of Appeal in KS Victoria did suggest two qualifications to that, if you like, quite radical conclusion. Uh, neither of those qualifications were actually part of the fundamental decision in the case, so they were technically uh, what we call obit dicta, but they are generally accepted as being authoritative, uh, authoritative and they have been treated as such ever since. The first uh, is that the Court of Appeal said a guarantor is able to validly sub-guarantee the former tenant's arga. Uh, and that was said to result from the fact that Section 24.2, which again we looked at earlier, says that a guarantor must be released or is released, quote, to the same extent as the tenant is released. And so if the tenant enters into an ARGA, the guarantor need only be released to the same extent, and there's nothing wrong with the guarantor guaranteeing that ARGA. And that's how the concept of a guarantee of an ARGA, or what we come to call a GARGA, uh, was born. Um, the second uh, exception that the Court of Appeal um, pointed out was that, in their opinion, whilst the guarantor cannot validly guarantee their immediate assignee, let's call them T2, uh, the guarantor can nonetheless give a valid guarantee on a yet further assignment to so a further assignee, T3 or T4, or whatever it might be. So as long as the guarantor has a rest from being the guarantor, uh, he or she can validly come back onto the scene as a guarantor on a later assignment. Now, we mentioned a moment ago that, that for many people in the property industry, there was considerable surprise and I think actually frustration uh, at this interpretation of the 1995 Act, especially that inability of a parent company to even offer a guarantee uh, 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 of an assignee on an intra-group assignment. Uh, and even a decade later, as we are now, I think speculation continues as to whether Parliament will or Parliament should legislate to alter the law, certainly on that point. So it seems like a good time for another poll. Uh, and we are going to put up our second poll and ask you your views. Uh, and we're asking, do you think, 10 years on, uh, with all that we know since, do you think that the Court of Appeal made the right decision in the KS Victoria case? Either yes, they got it spot on, or no, the Court of Appeal went completely gaga. Cast your votes now, please. Julian, I was trying to listen to see whether I could hear Jonathan Seatler snorting in the room next to <laughs> given that it's his case and he's in chambers at the moment, but... <laughs> No kind of exclamations of anger. On your microphone, but there, there is a well. That's that's a that's a substantial majority in favour of the view that the Court of Appeal uh, went gaga, went wrong there. 
Um, I suppose, in a sense, it's a slightly unfair question because it, it, it perhaps conceals the question of whether the Court of Appeal interpreted the statute right, that there should be a change in the legislation. But one way or another, I think that's a, a fairly decisive view against uh, the law as it currently stands, which is 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 telling. Um, Ema. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the courts have continued to work out the meaning and the effect of sections 24 and 25 of the 1995 Act on leasehold guarantee. So, for example, um, a, a case in 2016, the EMI Group case, uh, decided that an assignment of a lease by a tenant to his own guarantor would be void. Um, and that was a case in which the guarantor had expressly taken on an obligation to indemnify that landlord. So that was an obligation that in effect made him liable as if that guarantor were principal debtor in respect of the obligations under the lease. And that indemnity was an important part of the reasoning in this case because it meant that if the guarantor was able to take, a take the tenancy from the tenant, it would mean that the guarantor was reassuming at the very moment of assignment the very obligations that it was supposed to be released from by section 24. So the way that the, um, the Court of Appeal had put it in the KS case was that the whole thrust of section 24 is that a person who is liable under a tenancy should not remain liable after the tenant with whose liability he's been associated has been released. And that led to this conclusion that a tenant can't pass on the tenancy, can't assign the tenancy to its own guarantor. I mean, I suppose uh, technically you know, one might pose the question as to whether the outcome would have been different or would be different in a case where the guarantor was was a true guarantor, not an indemnifier, i.e. someone with only a secondary <laughs> liability. Because, of course, in that case, on an assignment uh, from the tenant to the guarantor, the guarantor would be released from a secondary liability under Section 24 and would have imposed on it by Section 3 a primary liability, which is arguably different in nature and extent. Albeit, of course, uh, that new primary liability is yet more onerous than the prior secondary liability. So it still seems to run very much against the spirit of the Act. And I would have thought that's it's unlikely that that distinction would stand, but it, it's not actually been decided on the cases. And what about the, the some more recent cases, Harriet? Yeah, there are. So um, you've all heard Julian mention the birth of the Gaga, um, a guarantee of the Asinors Aga. Um, the most recent cases have all explored the precise boundaries of what is and is not a valid gaga. So let's have a little bit of a look at the gagas in a bit more detail. Um, so we looked earlier at section 16 of the 95 Act and argas. So that's the specific exception to the release of a tenant on assignment, which provides that the tenant can enter into a guarantee of the liabilities of the assignee. So that's our Arga, and it's the quite sort of limited circumspect um, exception that Julian outlined. Um, Julian also explained to us the concept of a gaga, which is the sub guarantee of an arga. Now, a gaga is not something permitted by section 16. In fact, that section says nothing about guarantors entering argas or sub guaranteeing them. And so a gaga is not subject to the specific requirements and attributes of an aga, which are contained in that section. Instead, a gaga has been held to be permitted by section 24, which is the section which requires a guarantor to be released only to the same extent as the tenant. Now, we know that from um, quite a recent decision, which I think we're having the Jonathan Seatler show because this is another of his, his cases, EMI Group and Prudential from 2001. And don't worry about noting it down because we'll be sending a list. And I notice someone's asked a question on the system about um, us reminding you of case names. Don't worry about that. You'll get a list of case names that come, come later. Um, anyway, EMI Group and Prudential, what the court said and explained quite succinctly at sort of para 55 of that decision, referring to the KS Victoria case that um, had come before in 2012. I think that's right. Um, they said, what makes a gaga valid is the operation of section 24-2, because the requirements for an aga set out in section 16 do not apply to the gaga, but the guarantor can enter into it 
because its effect is that he will be released at the same time as the tenant. Um, and what, using the judge's words from EMI Group and Prudential, they said, this analysis in KS Victoria Street makes it clear in my view that the focus is on the fact that the guarantor will be released when the tenant is released and not on the terms which require the arger. So Julian. Yeah, and so against that background, uh, uh, we can ask ourselves, what are the essential characteristics of, of a GAGA? Um, well, for a former tenant's guarantor to give a valid uh, GAGA, there needs to be the following. First of all, you've got to have a valid ARGA given by the tenant, logically. Uh, the GAGA then has to sub-guarantee the performance by the tenant of its obligations under that ARGA, properly construed, and finally, the GAGA must not impose on the guarantor a liability that is greater or more extensive than the liability imposed on the tenant under the ARGA itself. Now, that sounds potentially quite straightforward in practice. It's rather more difficult, in principle rather, it's rather more difficult in practice. And it's on those second two criteria uh, that there has been some focus uh, in recent cases. Yeah, so that the second of the two characteristics you'll recall that Julian was just outlining is the, the GAGA sub-guaranteeing the performance by the tenant of its obligations under that, that ARGA. So, for example, whilst a guarantor can validly sub-guarantee an ARGA, they cannot validly accept liability as co-guarantor under an ARGA. And this is the, the distinction that's that's been drawing been drawn out by the courts more recently. Um, so as Julian rightly has already pointed out, it can be quite e difficult um, to tell the difference between the valid sub-guarantee and the invalid co-guarantee. And ultimately, it's going to be a question of interpretation in a given case as to whether a guarantor has agreed post-assignment to validly give a GAGA or invalidly enter into another ARGA alongside the tenant as effectively the co-guarantor. Um, Julian, I think you're going to pick up on cooperative group, aren't you? Which is yeah, well, that, that, that's right, Harriet. I mean, the, the best case on this issue is the case of cooperative group against A and A Shah Properties, which is it was reported in in 2019, where it was held that a covenant by uh, the guarantor to extend its existing guarantee under a lease to the covenants given by a tenant in a license to assign was properly interpreted, took effect as a sub-guarantee of a tenant's ARGA, so it did, it did work uh, as a GAGA. Uh, that was even though an earlier clause in the same licence had been held to be a void attempt by the very same guarantor to sign up to the tenant's ARGA itself as a co-guarantor, which is, as Harris just mentioned is, is what you can't do. So on slide seven we're including, we, we've got the wording that was used in the void provision so that's the void co-guarantee attempt uh, in the in the license in question. The tenant and the tenant's guarantor covenant to observe and perform the obligation set out in the ARGA immediately after completion of the assignment. And we can see uh, from that that it's it's an agreement by both of them to enter into the same ARGA alongside each other. Uh, and that's an invalid co-guarantee. If we move on to the next slide, we can see a further uh, uh, clause from the Shah case. This time, the words of the valid sub-guarantee in the Shah case. Uh, and that clause read, in consideration of the consent granted by the landlord and subject to clause 4.3 of the tenant's guarantor, uh, agrees that its guarantee and other obligations under the lease shall remain fully effective and A, to the extent that any provision of this license varies the terms of the lease shall apply to the lease as varied, and B, and this is the crucial limb, shall extend and apply to the covenant given by and the obligations on the part of the tenant under this license. Now, you remember that the, the ARGA in this case was contained in the license, therefore the effect of limb B uh, in front of us there on the slide uh, was to create a valid sub-guarantee of the ARGA, a GAGA. Uh, and we can remove slide eight now uh, and Harriet will, will, will pick things up. Yeah, so um, that's that's kind of one aspect of what we've got out of the cooperative and Shah group. And, but equally, it's going to be a matter of interpretation as to whether the guarantor has agreed to enter into a liability that goes beyond merely sub-guaranteeing um, the ARGA. Now, that um, was, the, was an issue in the recent case that I've mentioned earlier of EMI and Prudential, um, where it was argued in that case that the guarantor had entered into an obligation that could endure beyond the duration of the ARGA. 
Now, in, in approaching these questions of interpretation, you, when you're sort of looking at these matters um, in, you know, in advising your clients, you have to apply, of course, the usual principles of contractual construction with which we're all familiar, but it's worth just reflecting on um, a couple of other pr um, pr principles that um, we may also need to um, consider, which are two less commonly, two less commonly applied principles. Um, they were considered in the Supreme, by the Supreme Court in a case called Egon, Zender and Tillman, which is a 2020 case. Again, don't worry about noting it. It's actually a case on restrictive employment covenants, um, not leasehold guarantees, but these principles apply to both areas. The first principle is the one of validate if possible. Now, what that principle tells us is that if there is more than one alternative realistic rival construction of a provision, and one interpretation will result in the provision being invalid, but the other competing interpretation will not, then the court should adopt the interpretation that will result in the agreement being valid. Because, and here comes the sort of the reasoning, common sense dictates that the parties would have intended an interpretation um, that results in a lawful contract rather than on something that's invalid. But Julian, you're going to pick up on the second principle, aren't you? Yeah, well, the, the, the second principle that was addressed in the Zander case uh, and is relevant in this area is the principle of severance. Um, and if and to the extent that the words of the contract compel an interpretation that would render the contract invalid, it is open to the court to sever the offending words to validate the contract, provided certain conditions are met. Uh, now, the first of those conditions is that it, it's it's it must be necessary or it must be achievable, I guess is the better word, simply by removing the offending words. You can't add words through the process of severance, uh, which the, the Supreme Court made very clear in the Zenda cases. It's all about removing words, not adding them. Now, that, that's quite interesting when you consider that in the modern law of construction, of course, we're all perfectly used to the idea of words being interpolated in certain circumstances. So it's clear that severance is not, is not a pure principle of contractual interpretation. Um, the second uh, condition for the operation of severance is that the remaining terms continue to be supported by adequate consideration. Uh, I mean, often in a property context, you'll be dealing with a deed, so that, that ought not to be an issue. But it, it, if you're not dealing with a deed, it, it, you will need to make sure that there is still uh, adequate consideration. Finally, third criteria, uh, the removal of the offending words must not result in a major change to the overall effect of the contract. Well, that's easily stated, of course, quite difficult to apply in practice, but those, those are the principles. And that approach was applied in the context of, of leasehold guarantees in that recent EMI and Prudential case uh, it, itself, which is definitely um, mandatory reading when you, when you get the case list from us after the session. So let's turn to a new topic now. Harriet and Ema are going to look at the question of the release of guarantees by variation. Yeah, absolutely. So um, with, there are two aspects that we need or matters that we need to consider here. Um, the first relates to the general law of guarantees, which can to continue to apply notwithstanding the 1995 Act. And then the second um, are restrictions that the 95 Act itself places on um, guarantors' liabilities in the event of a relevant variation of tenant covenants. So looking first at the general law, um, the 95 Act specifically declares that the rules of law relating to guarantees are subject to, to its terms, that's the terms of the 95 Act, applicable in relation to Argus. And we know that from section 16.8. Um, those um, rules of law uh, include those relating to the release of, of sureties. Um, and those rules will also apply to any other valid guarantee agreement. The key one, when we're looking at um, the question of whether they, there is some other reason that the guarantor can latch onto to indicate that they've been released from their um, obligation, is um, referred to as the rule in Home and Bronskill, which is a case from um, 1877. It's been around for a while. Um, and that case established that a surety will be entitled to treat themselves as released from the covenant of guarantee if the obligations which they guaranteed are varied by the principles, so in this case, our landlord and, um, and tenant, 
without his, the surety's consent, in a way that it cannot be said without having to engage in factual inquiry, that the surety could not be prejudiced by the variation. Now, I've gone through that quite quickly. So the, the key points to kind of pick out of that is that you're trying to look for whether there has been um, some variation of the underlying obligations which were, were guaranteed um, without the consent of the surety, the guarantor, in a way that without having to analyze the underlying sort of facts, um, you can't, the surety can't say that um, they would be, that they could not be prejudiced by the variation. So take note of the fact that the rule firstly is only engaged where the guarantor doesn't consent and the consent of, um, because the consent of a surety to a variation will be binding subject to the statutory provisions such as section 18, which, which we will come on to. So Ema, are you going to unpick the, the rule for us? Yes, I will. Well, this rule in home, despite its antiquity, is actually of interest to, to lots of, of um, lots of different categories of client. You need to consider it if you've got any landlord seeking to enforce a guarantee. If you're advising the guarantors of, a, of an actual tenant, not getting up for a moment about guarantors under an aga. When you're advising a former tenant who guarantees the obligations of their assignee under an aga. If you're looking at a guarantor who's sub-guaranteeing the former tenant's obligations under an aga, so that's the gagas we've been discussing, and any case where you're looking at guarantors of former tenants who haven't been released pursuant to the automatic release provisions of the 95 Act. So this is really a really key principle to, um, to, to bear in mind. Um, no matter who you're acting for, um, we need to remember that the rule applies to variations of the principal contract. And here, that's the lease. Now, it's a bit difficult whenever you're dealing with leases because whether a related contract, like a license to assign or similar, results in a variation to the principal contract, the lease, can require very careful consideration of the terms and the effect of the license. So you have to look at the lease, but you also need to look at the ancillary documents to see whether they have in fact result in a variation of the contract that could mean this rule kicks in. Um, the rule in home applies to variations which at least on the face of it increase the guarantor's liability to a, a material extent. The classic examples in the LNT context are where there's been variations in the repairing obligations, or variations in the reinstatement obligations. So when acting for any of these categories of clients, for example, when acting for a landlord seeking to enforce a guarantee, it's always worth asking whether there were any licenses to alter or other consents given after the guarantee was entered into and which were not provided for or contemplated within the lease itself. We'll come back to that point. And that way you can assess whether there are any variations which could be said to engage the rule in home and release the guarantor. Yeah, um, I mean, there, there are also um, then two further questions to, to ask yourself. Um, the first is, has the operation of this rule been excluded by agreement? And the second is, is there something else in the guarantee which acts to protect the landlord from the effect of the rule? Now, these questions are answered as a matter of construction of the guarantee. <laughs> um, although case law has provided us with some general guidance and that general guidance is as follows. Clear and specific words are likely to be required if the surety's liabilities are to be retained, notwithstanding the changes in the terms of the principal contract. Um, some general sort of rubric um, in the terms of the guarantee about preserving surety's liabilities is probably not going to suffice. Now, again, easy to state the principle, um, precisely where the line between those two positions is going to be drawn is likely to end up being subject of yet further debate in court insofar as it hasn't been already. Um, so having a look at what case, some of the case law that we've got in a case called um, Horndon Industrial Park and Phoenix Timber, which is a decision from 1995, um, a covenant of guarantee which stated that the guarantor would be liable for the tenant's default and then here are the words notwithstanding any other act or thing whereby but for this provision the guarantor would have been released 
those words we might think are sort of impressionistically quite clear about the parties understanding that there wouldn't be a release in the event of some subsequent act or thing. But in that case, that was held to be too generic to cover a situation where the underlying obligations were increased. And so the result was that the rule in Home and Brunskill was, was still engaged. Um, not all the cases are from the, the 90s, although quite a few of them are. Um, in the more recent case of Topland, Portfolio and Smiths, which I think is again one of Jonathan's cases, <laughs> um, <laughs> the guarantor was released um, following landlord's consent, which permitted various alterations. Um, despite there being an absolute covenant against alteration. So the underlying obligation in the lease was an absolute covenant against alterations. Landlords' um, consent had permitted various alterations. And in those circumstances, the guarantor um, was released from the guarantee. Now, the court construed the relevant provisions in the Topland case and considered that so far as the burdens imposed on the lessee, by the covenants against alterations were concerned, the surety would have known at the time when it became party to the lease that those burdens couldn't be increased as a result of the um, alterations to the demise premises because no such alterations were permitted under the lease. Now, that's significant um, when you're looking at Topland. You need to remember that that's a case that's considering circumstances where the guarantor at the time um, was endorsing a lease that included an absolute covenant against alterations. Yeah, that's right, Harriet, isn't it? Because I think <clears throat> you have to ask the question, would the position be different if the guarantee contained those similar clear wording saying no act or thing would, would change the guarantor's liability, but the underlying covenant against alterations was qualified and not absolute. So, for example, the alterations were permitted but required the landlord's consent. Now, that's undecided in the cases, but, but we think the outcome may well be different. And then in that case, the ruling home might well be excluded. Um, the, the, the reasoning of, of that position is that so long as the landlord giving consent to alterations was within the terms of the covenant that the guarantor signed up to guarantee, then we think the effect of the guarantee was that those alterations were within its purview. And so there's, there's no good argument from the guarantor to say that something that was anticipated by the lease ought to release it from its liabilities under the home rule. Okay, so Harry, thank you, you're already doing it. So slide nine, okay. So this brings us to the second point, um, which is that there are restrictions in the 95 Act itself that places on <laughs> guarantors um, liabilities in the event of a relevant variation of tenant covenants. So um, we've got sections 18, one to three up on, on the slide. Um, if you just have a look at those whilst we're sort of speaking. So the point here is that where a former tenant has guaranteed the performance by his assignee under an AGA, um, section 18, three of the 1995 Act operates to release the guarantor of the former tenant from an amount that is referable to any relevant variation of the tenant's covenants following assignment. So you've got former tenant has guaranteed the performance by his assignee under an AGA. If there is then a relevant variation um, of the tenant's covenants following assignment, then you need to have section 18.3 in mind because that may operate to release the, the guarantor of the, of the former tenant, but from an amount referable to, to the relevant variation. So a few points to note, um, having kind of unpacked that a little at this stage. The first is that section 18 only provides for the restriction of liability if and insofar as the liability has been increased by the relevant variation. That's clear from the use of the words to the extent that in, in section 18. So unlike the common law principle, under the act, a variation does not wholly release the former tenant or guarantor. It merely relieves them of liability for any increase. <laughs> the second point to note is that the restriction releases liability for the principal amount of the increase plus interest or costs and other expenses. So it's not just the principal amount, it's also 
um, interest costs or other expenses um, that relate directly to the to the relevant variation. Um, thirdly, the variation includes variations by deed or otherwise. So it's wide enough to cover oral variations um, insofar as or oral variations can be lawfully made. If we switch, yeah, so turning now then to section 18.4 um, and looking at what is meant by relevant variation. Well, there are two conditions that need to be satisfied if you're, if you're going to um, establish that there's been a relevant variation. Um, the first is if the landlord has an absolute right to refuse to um, allow it. Now, it's doubtful that this condition can ever be satisfied where there's a qualified covenant against alterations or any other fully qualified tenant covenant. So um, something where, you know, reasonable refusal, etc. But arguably, if the landlord was in fact entitled to withhold his consent, then Section 18 could be engaged but it seems doubtful that this was the intention of the provision. The second condition supplements the first. Um, a relevant variation is also one which the landlord would have, had an would have had an absolute right to refuse if the variation had been sought by the former tenant immediately before the assignment, but the landlord was somehow deprived of that ability by other variations in the meantime. So, this is aimed at preventing two stage variations, for example, by a landlord agreeing to change an absolute negative covenant into a qualified negative covenant. Um, Harry, if we pull down um, that slide. Okay, so that's, yeah. that, that's, basic, that's basically dealing with the relevant variations, but I think we're thinking we need to probably move swiftly on um, in view of the time. Now that's right, time's against us a bit and we've still got a couple of topics that we'd like to cover. Um, so I, I think Ima and I will try and take the next topic as quickly as we can. Uh, and that's really the question of preconditions to liability. So Ima, if you've got a valid ARGA, let's assume we've, we've established we've got a valid ARGA, what do we need to do in order to enforce that ARGA against a former tenant? Yeah, so again, the 95 Act changed the law in this respect. Prior to the 95 Act, a landlord could bring a claim for rent or other sums due under the lease against a former tenant or their guarantor at any time within the relevant limitation period. And where you've got a lease, that could mean, which is by deed, that can mean up to 12 years after the rent or other sum fell due. But Section 17 changed all of that. The landlord now has to serve a notice on the former tenant, informing him that the sum is due and the landlord intends to recover it from the former tenant. Now, it's important that you serve this notice and that it complies with section 17 or the former tenant isn't liable at all under the AGA. Um, it's never been definitively decided whether this notice under section 17 is an essential ingredient of the cause of action for a fixed sum by the landlord under the AGA, or if it's just a defense that a former tenant can raise if it chooses. Um, there is a case called Lee and Summer, which assumed that that it was an ingredient of the cause of action. And it did that, um, th be, assuming that was the effect of an earlier decision. But actually, the point hasn't been fully argued and it's not entirely clear from the act itself. Um, it's not just a, a cute pleading point. It's actually of some practical relevance because can a landlord just sue in debt if it's forgotten to serve a Section 17 notice and then is out of time and wait for the tenant to raise a Section 17 issue, or does it actually have to plead, yes, I served a Section 17 notice in order to make out its case at all? Um, Gillian, I think you were gonna look at that a bit further. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame the Act doesn't address this point because it's, it's pretty important to us as litigators. And, you know, clearly the safer course is, is always going to be to ensure that you've, you've got your Section 17 notices served so they can be pleaded. But, uh, now, section 17.4, if we, we just briefly touch on, on that section, uh, provides that the landlord can't recover a greater sum than the sum specified in the section 17 notice. That's logical given the, the uh, statutory purpose of the notice. So it is a crucial procedural step to take and to take it properly. We then come on to subsection six, which we've got on the slide that's just come up in front of you. Uh, the requirement to serve a section 17 notice arises where you're seeking to recover from a tenant any unpaid fixed charge, as it's called, that's payable under a tenant covenant of the tenancy that the former tenant has guaranteed. Now, fixed charge is a defined term there in front of us in section 17.6. It includes rent, 
we all know generally what that means. It includes service charges, ditto. Uh, but the more complex provision is the third, subsection 6C. It also include, includes any amount payable under a tenant covenant of the tenancy, providing for the payment of a liquidated sum payable in the event of a failure to comply with any such covenant. Now, the precise scope of that third type of fixed sum has never been decisively determined. Does the covenant in question have to be one which expressly provides for payment of a liquidated sum in the event of failure to comply with that covenant? That would be the narrow interpretation. There are such covenants. We're all familiar with, for example, Jervis and Harris clauses, which enable a landlord to give notice to the tenant to repair the property. The tenant doesn't repair, landlord can gain access, carry out the repair, and crucially recover the costs as a debt due. That clearly is covered, I think, by the, the, the fixed charge definition, but they're, they're pretty few and far between that type of clause. So that's a pretty narrow interpretation if that's all that's caught. The second way of looking at it is to say, well, the words any such covenant simply refer to any tenant covenant in the lease, in which case, any covenant providing for payment of a sum in the event of a failure to comply with any other covenant in the lease would be caught by the wording. The classic example being, for example, a covenant requiring payment of the costs incurred by the landlord on a, on a, on a section 146 notice under a covenant to pay such costs. And there is, in my view, there is at least an arguably even wider interpretation uh, that would require a section 17 notice wherever the sum the landlord seeks to recover is in practice a liquidated sum in the sense of being a readily identifiable sum at the point of breach rather than something that requires assessment by the court. I mean, one could take an example of a breach of a covenant to pay rates and if the tenant fails to pay rates the quantum of the rates is unlikely to be in dispute. Does that mean that a claim against a guarantor for that failure to pay rates, there's a claim for a fixed charge requiring a Section 17 notice? Probably not, but that's not an issue that has ever been resolved uh, and remains to be resolved. Uh, so we can move on from slide uh, at 12 now to look at the question of timing. Yeah, so in terms of timing, if you don't have very long, Section 17 2 requires the notice to be given within the period of six months, beginning when the date the charge becomes due. So six months to send the notice. But there is this question, well, what happens if the liability to pay arises on one date, but the amount of the fixed charge isn't known until a later date? For example, liability to pay a reviewed rent following rent review. Well, section 17.4 caters for this. In the fixed charge notice, the section 17 notice, the landlord can inform the former tenant of the possibility that its liability would be determined to be for a greater amount. The landlord has three months from the determination of that greater amount to send a further notice informing the tenant of the increased sum. However, for in terms of rent reviews, you probably won't even need to rely on section 17.4. Um, the House of Lords in Scottish and Newcastle in 2008 decided that the increased rent, the, the portion by which the rent was increased in a rent review, didn't become due for Section 17 purposes until the rent review had finished. So you serve a notice in relation to the passing rent, you can then serve a later notice in relation to the additional sums due. And this notice requirement applies to fixed charges under all tenancies as well. The former tenant and any guarantor has to be served with an appropriate notice in order to be liable. And I guess then the final question that is of interest is to ask whether Section 17 requirements apply to Gargans. Um, Section 17.3 extends the requirement to serve a notice uh, to those who guarantee, quote, the performance uh, by a former tenant of such a covenant as is mentioned in some Section 1. In other words, those who guarantee a tenant covenant of the tenancy under which any fixed charge is payable. But of course, under a GAGA, uh, the guarantor is guaranteeing the former tenant's performance of the AGA, not the underlying covenant itself. Uh, and Section 17.1 makes a clear distinction between the former tenant's liabilities under an AGA and the former tenant's liabilities on the original covenant. So I think on the language of Section 17.3, it doesn't uh, appear to extend uh, to uh, the requirement to serve a notice for sums claimed under GAGAs. That does, would seem to leave a bit of a lacuna in the law. Uh, one could argue that the statutory purpose of section 17, i.e. giving some sort of a forewarning uh, that sums are being pursued from former tenants and their guarantors applies every bit as much 
to a guarantor under a GAGA, and that may lead a court to adopt a purpose of interpretation of Section 17.3. Uh, before everybody departs for the morning, let's just have one final poll then on that point. Do you think that Section 17 of the 1995 Act uh, and the requirement to serve a notice should apply to a GAGA? And you've got two options there, either absolutely or nope, that would be really GAGA. Please cast your votes. Yeah, pretty resounding, resounding yes. And I think that, that is clearly one's instinct uh, in these matters, but it's not clear that that's what the law provides. Uh, Ema. Yes, yeah, so just the last point to cover on this is um, about the form of that notice. Um, Section 24, uh, Section 27, four of the 95 Act provides that the notice has to be in the prescribed form. If it's not in that form or a form substantially to that effect, it isn't effective. And the form is set out in um, a statutory instrument uh, from 95. And we'll look, we'll just finally, with the, we, we have now technically run over, we'll carry on a little bit. I'm conscious some of you may need to leave. Please feel free to do so if you've got other appointments. Just wanted to finally say something about old tenancies, which from the poll that we did earlier, in fact, you know, quite a few of you are still seeing, over a third of you said you're still seeing old tenancies. So it would be remiss of us not to say anything about them. Obviously, the key feature of an old tenancy is that the original tenant is not released from liability under the covenants uh, in the lease on an assignment. Uh, instead, because of the rules of privity of contract, the original tenant remains liable to the landlord throughout the term of the lease, regardless of how many times it's assigned onwards. And the liability of the original tenant is owed equally to any assignee of the landlord's reversion. And that's achieved by automatically, actually, by statute, section 141 of the 1925 Act. So liability of the original tenant will endure throughout the term, even if the landlord changes. And for our present purposes, the key point is that the same principle applies to any guarantor who has acted as surety of the original tenant. There's a technical difference because on an assignment of the landlord's reversion, it passes by a different means, but the, the effect is the same. So if you're acting for a landlord of an old tenancy, you must, of course, bear in mind that in addition to the current tenant and any guarantor um, of the current tenant, it's always open to the landlord to use, to sue rather, the original tenant and their guarantor, if any. And then if one comes on to the question of intermediate assignees of the, of the term, uh, who held the lease subsequently to the original tenant, but have since assigned it on, what about their guarantors? Well, the basic principle is that an assignee of the term is only liable for breaches committed during the term the lease is vested in them. That's because of the concept of privity of state. There's no privity of contract with those intermediate assignees. But of course, prior to the 1995 Act, it had become very common, if not universal, for landlords to require assignees to enter into direct covenants with landlords as a condition of consent being given to assign. And that direct covenant would commonly be expressed to be an undertaking to observe all the covenants and conditions of the lease for the duration of the term. Moreover, any guarantee of those, any guarantor of the intermediate tenant was required to guarantee that obligation. So again, the effect, and it was very much one of part of the mischief the 95 Act was aimed at solving, uh, was to tie in those intermediate tenants and their guarantors for the duration of the term. Um, I, so- I in there, Julian, because what's quite surprising- Yeah, do, do. Sorry, um, there's ne it's a bit surprising that it's never been definitively decided whether the benefit of a direct tenant covenant from an intermediate tenant under a license to assign will pass automatically to an assignee of the landlord on an assignment of the reversion, or whether it must be expressly assigned. I think we say surprising on the basis that, um, you know, this is, these arrangements have been in place for quite a long time and one might have thought that it would have cropped up in the case law. But what it means is that anyone acting for a former intermediate tenant who has given such a covenant to a former landlord without any express assignment, might still want to take that point one day. Um, isn't that the, the sort of the question to ask, Julian? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it remains to be seen. It's odd that it hasn't been decided uh, hitherto. Uh, and of course, finally, the, the key point to note on old tenants is, is that it is vital for landlords to remember that they've got to serve Section 17 notices on any previous tenants or their guarantors. And that takes us back to all of that material we looked at in the previous section.
So that brings us to the end of our substantive sections. Look, we've gone over by five minutes. I think we've, I understand, I haven't looked at them yet, but I think we've got a lot of questions have been raised uh, and that's great. Rather than trying to uh, rush through them all now, I think what we will do is, is give replies to those of you who have uh, put your name on your questions and we'll perhaps just take five minutes to address some of the anonymous questions that have been asked. Um, so let's, I'm just going to go live with this before, before uh, reading, reading it. Uh, and this uh, anonymous attendee asks, does it benefit the landlord to have one over the other? As surely the aim remains the same and the outcome results in liability somewhere or another. Yes, I think that's whether it's guarantee or indemnity, because I think that was an early, an early question. I think I think given the difference between guarantees and indemnities, um, it, it is more beneficial to have both, certainly. And yeah. the thing with an indemnity is you don't need to prove the underlying liability of the tenant to pay the sum. It's just the loss. All you need to show is loss, and then the indemnity kicks in. Whereas if you have a guarantee, you have to prove the underlying liability of the tenant, and then the guarantor has all these possible defences. So they can they, they they'll be able to rely on on all the things that, that Harriet was outlining earlier that, that apply only to guarantees. So I think there is some benefit. Certainly, you ideally want both, but I think if it was one or the other, you'd probably want an indemnity, right? Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, agree. And also, you avoid all of those awkward principles that, that allow the guarantor to get off if there's a variation or a forbearance. Yeah, yeah. Sort of yeah. exactly. Uh, no, good, good, good question. Uh, let's go down. We've got another one here, which I'll go live on. Does this limitation apply only where guarantor's original obligation looks to stretch over to future assignments. What's the position of the guarantor as a party to lease one, then the lease is assigned to a new party who's a related company to the original lessee, and the guarantor is the same party and their party to the new lease assigned lease. Should they have had a break or are they liable? Well, I think the answer is they... They need to have a break, don't they? They've had a break, yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, I mean, they've got, they have to have a break. It could be a very brief break. Yeah. Uh, it could be a de minimis break, I think. Well, I suppose arguably it was de minimis, it might not count as a break, but you do yeah. have to have a break, I think, to be honest. I don't think it makes much difference, to, to answer the start of the question, I don't think it makes much difference whether the way that it's worded is that the guarantor is stretching its liability to cover the future assignments, or if the guarantor does it in a different document, even if it, that document comes later. The 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 rationale and the reasoning of the KS Victoria case is that either way, that guarantor, that guarantee is invalid and void under the 95 Act. Yeah. Without without a without a break or without without something else. Yeah. <clears throat> Protecting it. Okay. Thank you for that one. The, the next question I, I I I don't have an answer to myself because I haven't really no. seen it. It's an interesting one to pose. Uh, oh sorry, is there any I thought I'd seen a different one there. Uh, sorry, I, let's go to that one. Is there any downside to send the guarantor to the Gaga a Section 17 notice, or is there a benefit to serve a copy of the original Section 17 notice to the guarantor of the Arga? Um, I think I, I don't think there's any downside to sending a Section 17 notice, save possibly that it may be said to be an acceptance that you're required to serve a Section 17 notice, and I suppose if you then got it wrong in some sense, you, you might increase the chances of it not working out, but I think I think I don't see a downside myself. Is there a benefit to serve a copy of the original Section 17 notice to the guarantor? I think the key thing is you've got to make sure this comes back even to your point on the prescribed form, doesn't it? Really, I mean, you've got to make yeah. sure it's the right person. I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I would. I would probably. I mean, belt and braces. You might want to do both. So we send the guarantor its own Section 17, but do you might also send the guarantor the copy of the the original section 17 that you've served. Um, but I mean, I think you want to be, you know, the requirement is to serve the notice. The fact that you've, for example, served the notice on four people when only you need to do it on two, that's not going to invalidate the two you've sent. So I think you want to go for, for more being better rather than fewer. And I can't really see much of a downside. I mean, it will put the guarantee on notice pretty early doors, but that's really the purpose of section 17 in the first place. Okay, thank you for that question. I think we've just got, not sure whether we've got any more. We've got, oh, here we are. This is the one I was actually referring to earlier. What workarounds are you seeing in practice to cure the problem of repeat guarantees where for commercial reasons, the parent is the only available entity to support the assignment? Well, 
I, it's unfortunate that we're not able to sort of open that one up to the audience because I suspect we'd get some interesting answers there. I I can't say I'm I've seen any sort of clever workarounds recently. I don't know whether Harris and Ema have have encountered anything. No. Um, no, I think I've just seen Gargas as the sort of attempt to try to ensure that there's some sort of continuing. Um, guarantee, but that's generally been in a limited context where you've got um, tenant number one had a friendly entity that was guarantor, and then friendly guarantor is willing to continue be to be guarantee in some way, and then they just do it through the Gaga mechanism rather than anything kind of really clever. Um, I mean, one of the questions that was posed that it might be with the named person, it might be worth us touching on why we still got so many listening to us, which is amazing, um, is that this offered workaround. I don't know whether either of you have thoughts on this. So Chloe Med Meredith has asked if the lease is varied in a way um, which releases the guarantor, let's say the guarantor was not, no, I'm picking the wrong question. Sorry, here we go, here's the right one. If you mm -hmm. want to assign to a guarantor, and it's Cassandra Fleming, if you want to assign to a guarantor or to keep the same guarantor on assignment, could the parties not just surrender the old lease and then grant a new one um, on the assumption that the benefit of that might outweigh the costs and ta tax implications of that contractual arrangement? Would that arrangement or any agreement for that surrender, agreement for lease, fall foul of section 25. Now, I, have to, I must mm -hmm. confess, I was having a look back at section 25 because this question struck me as actually really very interesting, not least mm -hmm. because if this potentially worked, then maybe these are the creative things that the transactional lawyers and um, yeah. those in, yeah. who us are thinking of doing. Um, yeah, but, but, yeah, go on, go on, Harry. Go on, go on. Well, no, I was just gonna say, I, I was looking back at the language in section 25. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know whether you have any thoughts immediately, Julian, on it, but my my thought was that on one narrow reading of section 25.1, you might say that arrangement works, but I instinctively um, feel nervous sort of proffering that as a concluded view on the basis that um, the reasoning of the, of the judges in various of the cases that have already been decided sort of tends to take quite a sort of wide more what one might under, see as more purposive approach rather than reading the act um, more narrowly. I don't know what's your thinking, Julian or Ema. Well, my, my, my own thoughts. I, I I think you're right to feel nervous about it because I I just remind myself that in KS Victoria they did cast the net very wide and they said that it that it, it prevents any agreement which uh, I haven't got the right wording in front of it. Any agreement the effect of which is to is to result in the guarantor continuing to be liable and and I just think the agreement to surrender the lease is certainly strongly arguable that it is nonetheless caught by that I mean it's it's a it's a clever idea it, of course yeah. the, the costs and tax implications could be considerable in a, in a given case and might outweigh the benefits of it but I'd still be nervous that it that it that it doesn't work I mean obviously the whole point of the anti-avoidance provision is to prevent there being any workarounds that's the, yeah. the but I think and the way that that is done is because section 25 is, is addresses the effect of the result of the agreement it's not yeah. it's not a, it's not sort of defining the particular agreements yeah. that are void it says if the if the it's any agreement relating to a tenancy and it's voided if its effect is to exclude modify or frustrate yeah. the release that the 95 act is supposed to um impose so i mean there might be a way of doing it but i, I guess you'd have to it would all have to be separate. If you did it, your best chance of it working would all have to be separate steps. So you can have an agreement to surrender under which the guarantor promised to then, in the new lease, provide a guarantee because that just looks like a workaround. But if you just are happy to take the risk of just surrendering everything and then immediately having everything signed again, yeah, I mean, that might work, but I, I, I kind of have to share everyone else's unease just because of the, the way that this has been interpreted in the cases and, and the fact that this is a kind of um, the results based section. It's looking at what the result is of what the party is. Sorry to interrupt because I know we're going to get guillotined at, at any moment. So uh, <laughs> they will. I mean, not literally, fortunately, or hopefully. But, uh, <laughs> so, look, thank you very much for everyone who's still with us for attending today. We, we would love your feedback. There'll be a short questionnaire will pop up in your browser once the session's over. Please give us feedback because that's the only way we can learn from and improve on these 
on these sessions. The recording of all of this will be available on our YouTube channel. So you just find our channel, just go Wilberforce Chambers on YouTube. Uh, and it just remains for me to thank you all again for coming. Thank you also to uh, Haley and Harry for assisting us. Uh, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day and have found it a helpful session. Thank you.